There is nothing more powerful than a girl group that has gained the respect of millions, both all across the globe and right on their doorstep. As a result of all this love and adoration, girl groups have developed into the perfect distraction from the harsh reality of the real world they exist in, and companies would be incompetent if they didn't realise the power they hold. After the disastrous fall of our former Prime Minister Liz Truss, I heard quite a lot of women in the UK talk about the idea of the glass cliff. So we've all heard of the glass ceiling. And if you haven't, the glass ceiling is commonly referred to women who find it harder to be promoted to higher positions as opposed to their male counterparts, who often take the roles of leadership positions. So what happens when you, as a woman, break the glass ceiling and are then thrust into these leadership positions that pretty much only men have held before you? Well, considering the circumstances you were given this position under, there's a possibility you are being left to fall off the glass cliff. In an article exploring the glass cliff, Julia Kagan writes, The term glass cliff refers to a situation in which women are promoted to higher positions during times of crisis or duress, or during a recession when the chance of failure is more likely. Put simply, women in these situations are set up for failure. Promoting women gives companies someone to blame if she fails to pull the company out of its downward spiral, and if women fail, companies are free to reappoint males to their positions without reproach. Companies look good when they promote women to leadership roles, so even if they fail, the company still earns a reputation of being progressive. While we have seen a textbook example of the glass cliff happen within the K-pop industry before with the promotion of a new female CEO of YG Entertainment, Wang Bo Kyung, who was appointed to this role right in the middle of co-founder and well-known CEO Yang Hyun Suk's bribery and gambling scandals, and of course we can't forget the intense media coverage of the Burning Sun scandal that was tearing apart YG like a tornado at the time. I'm actually not going to be following the textbook definition of the glass cliff in this video, but instead more of a definition that came to my mind over the past few years when I begun to see a lot of parallels from the theory of the glass cliff in the way the industry has used girl groups both as shields and as weapons of damage control. So the glass cliff to me as it pertains to girl groups is when female idols are given promotions from trainee to confirmed girl group member from a group hiatus to a new album, during a period of publicised crisis for a K-pop company, in which the only reason they are given these opportunities to further their career or start it is for the sole purpose of distracting the public from a company's controversies and atrocities that are being exposed in real time. These young girls and women in these groups are often set to even higher and harsher standards to not only beat their predecessors or competition from other companies, but they are expected to save their company from falling apart due to negative press accumulated from polarising events and bad business decisions. And of course, on top of all that, we have the hatred and the backlash that will be redirected to them and not the company. From the other fans of groups under their company on top of that, girl groups are often viewed as shiny new toys and companies know that nothing commands everyone's attention away from the bad than a good girl group. This is opposed to boy groups who form a strong cult fan base that very rarely expand to public recognition. It doesn't really matter if the girl group is successful or not at pulling the company out of its downward spiral because, due to the nature the group debuted under, they'll probably face hiatuses or poorly planned albums because their job as distractions were fulfilled. The company could even just neglect the girl group afterwards and invest in a new boy group instead. And to address certain K-pop stands who don't really view K-pop companies as capable of doing something so calculated, believing that this girl group was going to debut anyway, the timing is all just a coincidence. Which yes, I do believe rookies that happen to debut amongst controversy were always planned to debut at some point. But in addition to this, I do believe that at the will of K-pop company higher-ups, a debut that was always prepared can be revealed to the public at any time. And when it's time to save the company's image, their new girl group will be on the front line. There are also some K-pop stands, bless, they are very young, who believe that frivolous K-pop dating scandals are being used to cover up corruption in the Korean government, which is highly unlikely. But I'll tell you what is likely. 
K-pop executives debuting or handing out comebacks to girl groups as a way to cover up corruption, scandal and inner turmoil that's occurring within their own company that the public is well aware of. Today we are going to take a look at the many girl groups who were pushed off the glass cliff. Whether it be at the very start of their career or during it, I decided that even though everyone in this list is part of the phenomenon, I do think some situations are more serious than others, so I'm going to be giving them a score out of 5, from 1 being minor and 5 being severe. One of the most severe and undeniable cases of girl groups being pushed off the glass cliff was the rocky debut of SM Entertainment's Red Velvet in 2014, which is why I'm giving them a 5 out of 5 in severity. At the start of 2014, SM Entertainment was under investigation for tax evasion and were ordered to pay 10 billion won in response, so that's around 9 million dollars, I believe and this damaged the company's image. Girls' Generation were going through it in early 2014. Yuna and Lee Seung-gi were Dispatch's New Year's couple. On April 1st, Hyoyeon was embroiled in scandal over an incident with her ex-boyfriend Kim Jong-hyung, where it was falsely reported that she was violent towards him, and still in April, it was confirmed that Tiffany was dating Nick Hyun of 2PM. But although these controversies were all somewhat a major blow to Girl Generation's image, it was the Taehyun and Baekhyun dating reveal that really hurt SM Entertainment's biggest acts, EXO and Girl Generation, the most. But that's not all, as during May Don't Forget, EXOM's Chris filed a lawsuit against SM Entertainment to nullify his contract while also making bold claims against the company. And that takes us all the way into July, a week or so away from Red Velvet's debut in which FX were promoting their new album Red Light, but then promotions were ultimately cancelled, in which SM Entertainment claimed that this was due to Sully's poor mental health as an outcome of malicious comments. While Miu's were understanding of Sully's condition, they were baffled as to why the whole group had to cancel their promotions, when the usual industry standard is to have that one member take a hiatus while the group continues to promote. They were also upset that SM were telling the public that the group's promotions were cancelled because of Sully. All this did was put more attention and blame on Sully as online backlash and hate spread about her for ruining the group's promotions. Just three days after this announcement of FX's cancelled promotions and upcoming hiatus, three days. SM Entertainment announces the debut of their new girl group Red Velvet, and on the 3rd of August they make their debut with the song Happiness. Pretty much every SM fandom is pissed off and ready to attack Red Velvet. They wanted SM to fix the issues with their current groups and instead they were debuting a new girl group as a supposed distraction. The comment section for the music video was flooded with hate and mockery and the dislikes piled up. What made matters worse was the utter mess that was their debut song, Happiness. Now, I have seen many Reveloves claim that Happiness is Red Velvet's worst title track, and I've seen others say that it was the worst debut of all time. Now me, I am a Happiness enjoyer and defender, but even I can't deny how poor the execution of their debut concept was. The stylistic choices were at its best different and confusing, and at its worst, it caused offence to Japan as slurs could be spotted within the tacky newspaper design, which then meant the whole music video had to be re-uploaded with these headlines edited out. For a group who was given the best concept in girl group history in my opinion, happiness failed to explain what Red Velvet was really about and the group came across as misguided. The debut did moderately well on the charts as they were a big three group, but it was obvious to anyone who was there at the time that Red Velvet's debut had been a train wreck. The group debuted with four members, but for the first mini album a fifth member was added, Yeri. This caused even more confusion over what Red Velvet was supposed to be. Many of the times speculated that SM planned to add more members to Red Velvet, like a pre-Lunar, but this didn't happen. Still to this day, I can't really find a factual answer as to why Yeri didn't debut with Red Velvet. The widely believed theory is that Yeri was always intended to be in Red Velvet, but she was too young in 2014, so SM waited until 20. 
2015 to debut her. The second theory was that, due to the poor reaction of happiness, SM added Yeri to spice things up. The last theory is that Red Velvet needed five members because FX had four, so they could differentiate from the two groups and avoid Red Velvet looking like nothing but a replacement. One common implication across all these main theories though, is that SM clearly did not have a finalised lineup for Red Velvet and were unprepared in 2014. The worst outcome of Red Velvet's botched debut was the way it scarred Yeri's career. Because the public were first introduced to the group without Yeri and found her addition unnecessary. It hurts because who's to say if Yeri did debut with Red Velvet, maybe she wouldn't be the least popular member of the group in present day. And I'm sorry, but if you believe Yeri shouldn't have been in Red Velvet, then let's pray you never form a K pop group because you clearly don't know what you're talking about. I think that SM rushed Red Velvet's debut and the group just wasn't ready. They needed a girl group to immediately cover up all that year's scandals, more specifically the situation FX was in. Luckily, as Red Velvet soon became SM's only active girl group, they received specialised care and were able to grow into one of the best girl groups in the industry and the harm happiness did to their career could be forgotten. Red Velvet weren't always alone, as in 2020, SM Entertainment announced their new girl group, Espa, in such a similar way that all it could give you was a sense of deja vu. On October 22nd, Irene was still under fire for her power trip controversy, which ruined Red Velvet at the time as she was the centre, face and most famous member in South Korea. Only a week later, SM Entertainment announced the debut of their new girl group Espa. Espa were always going to debut, but the timing? Many predicted their debut right after the scandal hit and everyone was correct. And in a strange turn of fate, many believed that Red Velvet themselves were going to be FX'd. Fortunately, this didn't happen, and Esper didn't face as serious of a glass cliff that Red Velvet had to. At first I thought that Blackpink were lower on this scale, like maybe a 2 out of 5, but then I considered Blackpink's entire career so far, and I realised that it's more of a 4 out of 5. When 21 debuted in 2009, they were met with success, but YG himself just couldn't shake the feeling that he had made a mistake. Throughout the years, he would directly call 21 ugly to their faces, and his deep rooted belief that 21 were unattractive really seemed to bother him. The girls, like any other K pop idol group, got plastic surgery, yet the member who was believed to be going under the knife the most was Park Bomb, and this started to damage her image. But nothing ruined YG Entertainment and to anyone's career more than the drug scandal that Park Bomb was involved in. A former YG staff member alleged that Park Bomb was nicknamed the company's failure as a result of this controversy. After the massive backlash from the Korean public about it, to anyone were relegated to the YG dungeons and fans feared for the group's disbandment. In April of 2016, Minzy left to anyone and in August, Blackpink made their debut. The new girl group had been in the works for many, many years and they were probably ready ages ago, considering how YG is very slow with releases. If to anyone was going down, they needed their newer girl group more than ever to take their place. But while Blackpink had all the makings of a polished younger to anyone in the beginning, YG attempted many times to make the public aware that Blackpink would not be everything he hated about to anyone. He clarified that Blackpink would be a prettier version of 21, as their looks were a big problem for him, and Blackpink members were also asked to discuss a presumably fake prohibition clause in their contracts that claimed that the girls were banned from plastic surgery, almost to say to the public that the girls wouldn't be what Koreans call a plastic surgery monster like Bomb. YG's obsession with making a newer to anyone even went as far as labelling a trainee's dance practice as a performance by the future to anyone. Of course, all these similarities, the music, the member count and how the new girl group had been marketed, it really did set up Blackpink to be hated by fans of 21 and other second generation stands, who claimed that they were nothing but a 21 ripoff. But because Blackpink's debut was so impactful, hate became nothing but a whisper in the distance. You see, strategically, Blackpink's debut was sandwiched between 
Minzy's departure and 21's disbandment that happened a few months later. By debuting before the foreseen end of 21, YG could push a replacement girl group that would already be accepted by the public beforehand and former 21 fans dishing out hate would all become a minority. This tactic worked extremely well. So well that the way Blackpink were marketed really seemed to overshadow 21's legacy and contributed to the erasure of the group's original achievements. And that's the story of how YG set up these young girls to be attacked over a situation they had no control over. But this wasn't the only time, was it? YG went through what was labelled as the biggest scandal to ever hit the K-pop industry, and that was Burning Sun. This scandal really destroyed YG's image in the eyes of the Korean public, and even today the company still seems to have not regained that trust back. But YG knew exactly who could change public opinion in their favour, and that was Blackpink. So now not only have Blackpink debuted under assumptions pushed by the company that they are simply to anyone reimagined, but now they were made to release a new album in order to disguise the horrible crimes committed by the men under their label. And considering how much everyone loves Blackpink and that they have been gone for almost a year at this point, in my opinion it's obvious that they only got this comeback because YG needed a cover up and that they would have just kept them in the dungeon if they had the choice. So I'm sure we've all heard about the new YG girl group Baby Monster, who are set to debut very soon. And of course this girl group that has been teased for years, who almost seem like a myth, is only now coming out just days after YG took several hits. Icon left the label, it's been reported by media that certain acts will be moving to the black label, and of course there is YG's trial and the fallout of previous scandals that are still haunting the company. This is the context Baby Monster are going to have to debut under. And let's not forget the pressure to live up to Blackpink's success, a pressure none of the other boy groups under the label have ever had to face. Again, I believe Baby Monster were going to debut at some point, but their debut announcement being right after the latest news we've gotten about YG, yep, it's definitely a distraction. I'm not going to give Baby Monster a score yet because we haven't seen how their debut has been received or what it even is, so let's move on to the next group for now. You wouldn't expect Kepler to be on this list, would you? But in a grander scheme of things, Kepler were thrown off the glass cliff to some degree. I'd say around 2 out of 5. Remember that Mnet's former produce series was exposed for rigging, in a scandal that damaged the premise of survival shows forever. CJ, Ian M claimed that they would never make a survival show again, taking the situation very seriously. Or so we thought. Now what they really meant is that they were going to take a quick break and come back eventually. But who was going to take the fall for the controversy? Kepler's career. First of all, Mnet has a habit of making a female version of a certain show first and then making a male version because they think a female version will test the waters. And in this case, the girls on the show and eventually Kepler are all being used as nothing more than an experiment to see if Mnet can return back to their survival show Empire that they had with the produced series. You can see how this affected Kepler's output as a group and their popularity. Their concept and music isn't thought through to make a big breakthrough at this time. Why? Kepler are undeveloped lab experiments by the way Wake One treats them. Now that we're getting Boy's Planet, the male idols will have a leg up over Kepler. By this I mean due to X1's disbandment, people still reminisce about what could have been and might yearn for another Mnet survival show boy group. And of course, Boys Planet are not an experiment, they are the follow up as a result of Kepler's success. So they won't have to shoulder the doubt and the difficulty that Kepler has had to in their first year. Now if you're a second generation stan, you might remember the girl group Sonamu, who debuted at the wrong place at the wrong time. Definitely a 5 out of 5 from me. TSN, one of the worst K-pop companies, debuted girl group Sonamu right during the height of BAP's dispute with the company. As you could imagine, this did not go down well. 
Sonamu was supposed to distract people from BOP's ongoing fight against TS Entertainment, but all it did was draw more attention to the issue and it made Sonamu targets for a situation they had nothing to do with. This had long lasting effects on Sonamu's career forever, as they were never able to make it big when their company was just using them as a distraction while their money makers and most famous act was absent. If you haven't heard of Sonamu before, I strongly recommend giving their music a try. Their best songs in my opinion are Deja Vu, Round and Round, I Like You Too Much and Friday Night. It's possible that if the group debuted later and weren't a cover up, they could have seen more success than they did. We will never know. I'm conflicted with the light sum, so maybe a 3 out of 5. Not only was CLC falling apart, but G Idol, Cube's Golden Goose, was in the worst condition after the scandal of Sujin. It looked like this would be a nail in the coffin for G Idol at the time, and they needed another girl group to take the group's place if they were really going down. So during Sujin's hiatus, and simultaneously G Idol's hiatus, Cube looked to debut their new girl group, Lightsome, as a distraction and as a fallback if G Idol was not going to be able to recover. Lightsome didn't really have too much planning or an identity. Similar to Red Velvet's happiness, their debut failed to explain to the public what the group was really about. What made this situation worse is that Lightsum just kept morphing into different concepts with no consistency, which made their image as a group even more confusing to consumers. In theory, Lightsum was supposed to save G Idol, but it ended up being Sujin who would save them instead, as she left the group, and by leaving, the group could regain their fame again. So now, Cube didn't really need Lightsome anymore, yet now they have this new girl group with not much to do with them, and now all they can do is try and keep them afloat, even if their purpose to be a cover for G Idol isn't being fulfilled anymore. This resulted in two members being removed from the group so Cube could reorganise the lineup, a move that might just hurt Lightsome even further. The whole debut of Lightsome screamed panic. <laughs> Of course Lightsum had been in the works for a good while, but to debut under the pretenses they did, it's one of the many reasons the group didn't become a big hit like G Idol. I planned on talking about Luna, but I wasn't too sure, um, as I think not only am I waiting to see the outcome of what happens with everything with Blockbury, but I also plan on talking about Luna's entire career at some point, I don't know. Tell me whether you want that or not, I'm not too sure. <laughs> but anyways, I know this was a long video, so if you made it all the way through, thanks for watching. 